Welcome to the Blue Ridge Baptist Church YouTube channel. It's brought to you by the folks here at Blue Ridge Baptist Church, and we pray you receive a special blessing while spending the time here with us. And to God be the glory.
add a dollar to my name I've had friends that walked away And I've even lost myself a time or two There were bridges crossed and burned Through all the wreckage I have learned There is one thing that I can never lose If I've got Jesus I've got all that I could ever need Take the world away from me And I'll be okay If I've got Jesus There's a hope that's living deep inside a joy that I can never hide And a safe place to fall If I've got Jesus I've got it all I've seen weakness turn to strength I've seen failures met with grace and it's not from what I've done, it's Christ in me. A miracle I can't explain, always giving me his name. I'm the richest man that I could ever be. If I've got Jesus, I've got all that I could ever need. Take the world away from me And I'll be okay If I've got Jesus There's a hope that's living deep inside A joy that I can never hide And a safe place to fall If I've got Jesus I've got it all Someday that trumpet's gonna sound The King of Heaven will ride upon the clouds coming down I'll hit my knees, oh Lord, then sings my soul I'm going home I got Jesus I've got all that I will ever need Take the world away from me And I'll be okay If I've got Jesus There's a hope that's living deep inside A joy that I could never hide And a safe place to fall If I've got Jesus I've got it all If I got Jesus I've got it all If you have your Bibles, turn please to the book of Psalms, chapter number 62. Psalms chapter number 62, and then also I'd like to read a New Testament, well I don't know if you'd call it a parallel, but anyhow, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'd like to read a verse there, and uh, speak to you for a few moments from Psalm 62, and uh, read to you 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it's good to see you this morning. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad I'm here. Now, I tell you, this morning I thought about it's pretty cold outside, and uh, I looked up some of the churches that weren't having services this morning, and I come with this just an ace of uh, calling, you know, and saying, listen, it's so cold. Some of you older folks stay at the house. I'm glad I didn't do that. I have a, I'm negative towards that anyhow, but I'm glad I didn't do it. I figured Sister Ann, she rebuked me pretty good. She says, well, they got enough sense to know if they can come or not. <laughs> and so uh, 
I just quietened my mouth and ate my oatmeal and <laughs> said, let the chips fall where they will. So I'm glad. I'm glad you're here, and I thank God for you, and glad for our visitors being here, and we bless the Lord for you. Notice, if you will, Psalm 62, verse number 6. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. I'd like to dwell on that thought for just a minute. I shall not be moved. Psalm 62 is a declaration of David's confidence in the Lord. Now sometimes I wonder if we ascend to such a confidence that is available for us. So many times this comes up or that comes up and we get somewhat nervous. And if our hands weren't attached to the end of our arms in a very real legitimate way, we'd probably rub the things off, you know, just because we're wondering if God can take care of this. But the psalmist has declared that God is his rock and that God is his salvation and God is his defense and he shall not be moved. In verse number two, it seems to me as if David gets a little bit apprehensive about this bold of a statement. He says, he only is my rock, that's good, and my salvation, that's wonderful. He is my defense, that's great. I shall not be greatly moved. And it's almost as if there's that little thought right there that Maybe my rock isn't strong enough or maybe my salvation isn't secure enough or maybe my defense is not safe enough. I shall not be greatly moved. I want to declare to you this morning that we can stand in absolute confidence of our God. Can I get a witness to that? Now, this ain't a quiet sermon. It's just one I want you to get a hold to. We can stand in confidence to our Lord. You and I have been given wonderful, blessed uh, truths in the word of God that you can take home and take them to the bank with you. They are so. I was thinking in the New Testament, here's how Paul exhorts us. Therefore, my beloved, verse 58 of chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The apostle exhorts us, as did seemingly David, his generation, that we are to be steadfast in the Lord. We are to be unmovable. I shall not be moved and always abounding in the work of the Lord. I believe for the child of God that God has given to us some wonderful and precious passages in the Bible that would just help us and encourage us in this matter of confidence in God. For instance, let me read this verse to you, and there are many, many others. But he says in Romans 8, 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution? As we heard about in our Sunday school class this morning, what a tremendous truth that is or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long, counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, 
nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a wonderful passage that is to stir that element of confidence towards God in our heart. Again, Jude verse 24 says, Now unto him that is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, unto him be glory and honor forever and forever. One verse after another through the scriptures help us to realize that we can say without any shadow of a doubt because of the might and strength of Christ that we do not have to and shall not be moved. What a determination. What, a, what an exhortation God gives to us through his word. One of my favorite verses is over here in John chapter 5 in verse number 24. Listen to what he says right here. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. You know, at my own, in my own heart, uh, my heart is such a, a forgetful thing and, it, and my mind so wanders sometimes. I'm amazed that God would save somebody like me but this verse helps me to realize that he that heareth my word, I heard it, and believeth on him that sent me, I have believed, and he said, I shall not come into condemnation. Hallelujah, what assurance we can have in Christ. I was thinking about the different words in the, uh, the, that John gave to those that followed him. Listen to what John said in 1 John chapter number 5. He says there in verse number 11, This is the record that God has given unto us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. Praise God. Could I have an amen right there? He that hath the Son hath life. And uh, he that hath not the Son hath not life. The distinguishing mark between a child of God and someone who is not a child of God is whether or not Jesus lives in that heart. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. I'm just simply saying this morning that we don't have to fabricate a confidence in the Lord. God has caused things to be written in his eternal word that gives to us full assurance and great confidence that we can say, I'm not talking about in the weakness of our flesh, but in the power of his might, we do not have to be moved. I shall not be moved. Now, with that in mind, in Psalm 62, I'm reminded that there are some things that David faces in which he has said and declared, I shall not be moved. For instance, there in verse three and four, he talks about how long will ye imagine mischief against a man? talking about his enemies, imagining mischief and devising mischief against him. Ye shall be slain, all of you, as a bowing wall or a bowing wall shall ye be as a tottering fence. They only consult to cast him down. That is, evil men just want to cast down. He that is righteous, they only consult to cast him down from his excellency. They delight in lies, they bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. Can I say that David is saying, in the matter of opposition against me or against the righteous, I shall not be moved. I have drawn the line. I know where I'm going to stand and those that are opposed to righteousness, I'm going to stand against it. 
I shall not be moved by the opposition that raises its head against me. I think sometimes about the foes that may attack the child of God and attack your Christianity, attack you as a believer. Many are the foes of the righteous. And dear friend, we might find ourselves at times like old Jacob, all things are against man. But David says here that God is my defense. Your foes cannot hurt you when you're in the will of God. And uh, David says, my foes are not the obstacle right here. Opposition will not hurt me as a child of God. God is my defense. I do not have to lean upon the arm of the flesh. I can lean upon his almighty arm. I was thinking in light of that, you know the Bible says of us that we are sheep in his pasture. And uh, my sheep hear my voice and they know me. Thank God for that. Well, what about sheep? You realize that sheep are such defenseless animals this morning. They're not very smart and they're very defenseless. And if it were not that they had someone to care for them, they would perish. But they have a shepherd. And I'd say, dear precious friend of mine, you and I have a shepherd this morning that cares for us. And it's a wonderful thing that he is our defense. When the foes come against the child of God, the sheep of his pasture, blessed be the Lord that he is there to fight for us. You and I are not to fight. You and I are to trust. Our trust is in the Lord. I was thinking about we can trust him for the cares of life. Isn't that true? Aren't you glad that we can trust the Lord casting your cares upon him because he careth for you? What's your care this morning? You can take it to the Lord and leave it there. I'm glad that we can trust him for the provisions of our life. If he's watching over the sparrow and feeding the sparrow, if he's clothing the lily of the field, do you think I need to worry about what I'm going to wear or what I'm going to uh, put on? Oh, no, dear friend. I say to you that there is a shepherd over his sheep that watches his sheep and takes care of them. I was thinking about trusting the Lord right down to the very door of death. I'm glad he said that he was our shepherd and we not need to fear even though we're going through the valley of the shadow of death. We have a shepherd. Opposition is not an obstacle to us. and We'll stand against it and not be moved. I was thinking about in relation to that, to that in our lives, sometimes trouble raises its ugly head and it does. And it may raise its ugly head at any time. Most of the time, it's at the most inconvenient time. There's no good time to have trouble. And so trouble comes. You and I, as a child of God, have a second mortgage on trouble, friend. I mean, if it's anywhere, it's going to find its way to our house. But David said in verse number eight, I can trust him at all times. I'm glad of that, aren't you? At all times, daylight, dark, midnight, I'm glad, thank God, we can sing praises unto God and God can send the angel to open the prison door. David said elsewhere that the flood of ungodly men have made me afraid. But then he said in Psalm 56, what time I am afraid, I will trust in the Lord. Precious friend, I want to say to you, it's a wonderful thing, thank God, that we don't have to be afraid of our troubles. They'll come, they'll come, they'll disturb our heart, 
But thank God he's able to give us grace to stand against the opposition of trouble. Job, and you know the story of Job. One thing unfolded after another. And finally it looked like all was taken away and his body is racked with pain. And Job rose up in faith and said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. David says in the face of opposition, I shall not be moved. Opposition will come. And it does come. But God, verse number eight, is our refuge. The other night I spoke for a few moments over in Psalms 46. Listen to what he says. Three times he says, verse number one, God is our refuge, a strength, very present help in time of trouble. Again, down there in verse number seven, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Again, down in verse number 11, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Can I say to you, precious friend, opposition will come, but God is not only our defense, not only our salvation, but he is our refuge. In the Old Testament, they had six cities that were designated cities of refuge. They were a picture and a type of our Lord Jesus Christ who is the refuge for the believer. Unto him we have fled and we found safety and security. In the Old Testament, at the city of refuge, the manslayer who was guilty as far as taking the life of another, by accident or however it may have been, fled to the city of refuge and was safe from the revenger of blood, family members, you know. And uh, he stayed there until the death of the high priest. And then he was free to go out. Of course, his case was seen and went over by the people of the city, the elders of the city. If it was legitimate, he was given a place to stay and live until the death of the high priest. Well, you and I have fled unto Christ and we're there in the city of refuge safely living in God, in Christ. And we are there, spiritually speaking, unto the death of our high priest. Well, who is our high priest? It's the blessed Lord Jesus. You talk about wonderful security in him. Thank God you and I have no nothing against us because of what Jesus has done. David says, I'll stand. I will not be moved in the face of opposition. Though the foes attack me, though trouble assails me, though the opposition does come hand over fist against me, I shall not be moved. But then he goes on to say, go a little farther. You can't help it and I can't help it sometimes that men of low degree are exalted. But here in verse number nine, he says this. He says, surely men of low degree are vanity and men of high degree are a lie. If you were to lay them in the balances or put them on the scales, he said all of them are lighter than vanity. They're nothing but a puff of air. You know, sometimes in life, positions that men may hold and men of uh, that have been acclaimed great, uh, they have a way of challenging or frightening us on the inside. But I want to say to you, dear friend, men are but men at the best. And they may wield a mighty sword of authority, but the truth is God is the authority. Christ is the authority. And when you try men in the balances, you put them on the scale, their position, dear friend, is not something that uh, is going to weigh very much in the presence of God. Worldly position is temporary. Uh, let a man, th- as a, uh, let him that thinketh he stand taketh ease, lest he fall, the scripture says. 
I was thinking in relationship to those that have held mighty offices through the Bible. And I thought about Nebuchadnezzar. He really thought he was beyond the touchability of God, but God made him eat like, a, like an old donkey out yonder until he realized that the Lord of heaven hath his way, both in the heart of men and in the kingdoms of men. I will say to you, precious friend of mine, position is a very, very tangible, very transient thing. It's a temporary. And uh, you don't have to bow and you don't have to take and give up your status as a child of God. We are unmoved by the positions of men. I thought about Belshazzar, that wicked king, took his hands and wrapped them around the goblets of the temple of God and blasphemed God, and God sent a letter to him, said, this night your soul's going to be required of thee. I'm saying to you, precious friend, that God is able to do what man's not able to do, and you do not have to fear what men might do unto you. I was thinking about Herod, went out there and gave his little speech and acclaimed himself God. The next minute, his position didn't mean anything. God eat him up with worms. I want to say to you, as individuals, we don't have to be afraid of position. Even uh, nations, empires, the empires of the Bible, they were all great. I mean, Babylon was great. Israel was great. Judah was great. Uh, the Persians were great. The Midianites were great. But dear friend, God makes them come up and God makes them go down. And as soon as they get exalted in themselves, they're on the way down. I was thinking about in our modern history, England. England once held the torch of the gospel and loved God. But England, dear friend, gave up the torch and the light went out. And now it's a terribly, terribly God forsaken place. I was thinking again about Scotland. Scotland has produced some of the greatest preachers that ever walked upon this globe and some of the greatest missionaries ever walked upon this globe. But Scotland gave up on the sending forth of the gospel and now Scotland is in darkness and we're sending missionaries to them. I was thinking about America. America. Boy, God has exalted America highly in this world. And thank God, that's when America stayed on her knees and America loved God and America gave respect to God. But when America got exalted and puffed up and thought she could uh, steer her own course, brother God says, help yourself. Now you see what we got ourselves into. I want to say to you, precious friend of mine, We'll not be moved by the positions of men. We're going to stand with God. That's who we're going to stand with. David said, I shall not be moved by the opposition that comes against me, by those of position that may stand against me. He said, I, 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 and I think verse number 10 alludes to this. He said, I'll not be moved by riches. You know, verse number 10 says, trust not in oppression and become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart on. David says, now it's possible for riches to come into your life. Now I want everybody to be blessed. I really do. I, I, I want everybody to have a little jingle in their pocket. I, I, I do. I I mean, I, I might get caught up town and I need a little jingle. I want to be able to buy some from you. Oh, there he comes. I, I'll get some right there, you know. I think everybody ought to have a little jingle in their pocket. I ain't even got a billfold. This is the third time I forgot my billfold. Man, terrible. I think men ought to plan to have a little bit of something in there. I, I really do. But we're living in the most affluent society there ever has been. I know it looks kind of bad with the bionomics and all that kind of stuff. But I still got more money than I started off with. Ain't much, but I got more than started with because I didn't start out with nothing. Huh? Am I right? Now come on, somebody help me in here. Yeah. We still got more than we, we've been pretty affluent. And in our affluency, 
We have sacrificed spirituality. We got to where we could make it and we gave God his walking papers. You don't have to worry about us no more. We can do all right. And really, we're rich. Rich compared to some of the countries in this world. We are filthy rich. In fact, some of the countries of this world believe if you're just in America, you're rich. But riches are uncertain. If you increase in riches, he says. It's amazing how quickly we can take and come from affluency to poverty. It's amazing to me how that when God begins to deal with men and bless them, that the blessings can become so abundant that it takes away men's hearts from God and men's minds from the service of God. Somebody says, how can that happen? Well, it's kind of like this. You remember Solomon? How rich he was blessed with riches in the kingdom, gold and magnificence, majesty. Oh, Solomon. But after he got blessed, he got his heart started turning from God. Somebody said, well, what does that mean? Well, can I break it down a little closer? You remember when you used to love God and walk with the Lord and live for God and had to pray about everything, but you got a job promotion. But it required that you worked on Sunday. And it required that more time to where you didn't have time for God anymore. You laid your Bible aside. You quit praying. Oh, you got the little raise. But you lost what was more valuable to you than that little raise. Somebody said, oh, that wouldn't happen to me. Well, I know it wouldn't happen to you, but it's happened to others. What happened to you is you got a boat. You already work five or six days a week. So Sunday's your day. Isn't that right? And so now, if you don't use that boat, you just wasted your money. Oh, I can't help it. I got a new rifle. You know, Brother Ralph, I can't. What I'm trying to tell you is this. I'm trying to tell you, and I'm not against those things. I got a rifle. I got two boats. I'm going to sell one to Brother Andy, I think. <laughs> if you're not careful, what happens is you get so much of the blessings of God that you forget about God. You don't have time for them no more. Somebody says, you mean the blessings of God can take in? Oh, Yeah. He told Peter, he said, what are y'all caught? We ain't caught nothing. We've been out here all night long, ain't caught nothing. He said, well, just go out there and throw it over on the right side of the boat. And he threw the net over there and they pulled in and they pulled in so much that the nets break. I wonder if some of us hadn't pulled in so much that our nets are broken. We fight about to lose everything we had because we, y'all see what I'm talking about? Yeah, I mean, can you get you can get that point, can't you? David says, "I'm going. I'm not going to be moved by riches. Even if I get rich, I'm not going to be moved. Riches are uncertain. Riches are corruptible." Jesus said, "Lay not up for yourselves treasures on the earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt." Riches are not to be the objects of our heart. He says, "Set not your heart upon them." Riches can't buy things that are. That are, that are eternal. They can't buy heaven. They can't buy a new heart. Finally, Jesus said, the rich man came to him and they said, what must I do to be saved? How can I get to heaven? Jesus said, well, you got to do this and do this. And he said, man, I can't do that. Went away sorrowful. The disciples were watching it. And they said, how hardly? He said, how can, why can't a rich man get saved? He says, how hard it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Why? Because his heart's so tied up with everything else. Sometimes I think that's what we, what's happening in the world, don't you? Somebody say amen right there. Amen, amen Brother Ralph. Let me give you another little thing. David said, I shall not be moved if the riches increase. 
And then I shall not be moved by power. Men are striving for power and authority. And a, a man can't have nothing except it were given him of God. Pilate said, don't you know I've got power to have you crucified? He said, you can't do anything except for it's given of God. It's God that putteth down one and raiseth up another. God does that. Power belongs unto the Lord. Verse number 11, he said, that power belongeth unto God. Jesus said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Now I want to say to you, men are absolutely powerless to do anything about the things that matter. Isn't that right? Now, I, I think people get drunk on power. They think it, get, it mesmerizes them and it brings about bad things when you can't see power as it ought to be seen. We boast about power, power, all kind of power. Man, we can't even stop a common cold. You know, it's a sadness. But he says, I shall not be moved. Now with all that introduction out of the way, I want to say why. I shall not be moved. Why? Why could David say that? What kind of, what, what, what really makes him in his heart well up and say, I shall not be moved. Why? One is because my soul waiteth upon God. My soul waiteth upon God. Psalms 40 verse number one said, I waited patiently upon the Lord and he heard my cry. The Bible said, be still and know that I am God. Isaiah told Israel, he said their strength was to sit still. The prophet said, the race is not always to the swift. Not of him that runneth, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. I want to say to you, precious friend of mine, in verse number one, he said, truly, my soul waiteth upon God. For him, from him, cometh my salvation. Down there in verse number five, my soul waiteth thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. I'm waiting on the Lord. Waiting is not wasted time. He that waiteth upon the Lord shall renew his strength and shall mount up like wings of eagle. Run and not be weary, walk and not faint. I will say to you, precious friend, David said, I'll not be moved because I'm waiting upon the Lord. These other things may come in and try to divert my attention, but my mind and my heart is waiting upon the Lord. And can I remind you, Jesus said, watch and wait. Watch. You don't have to scurry around worrying about this, worrying about everything else. If your expectation is from the Lord, you're waiting upon Him. The second thing, I shall not be moved because my soul waiteth upon God. And then also, I shall not be moved because my expectation is from God. In verse number five, he says, my soul waiteth upon, uh, wait thou only upon God. My expectation is from God. It's not from the people I know. I have been blessed. I thought this morning, I was so thankful for all the people that God has brought into my life. I'm thankful for them. I'm appreciative for those that God's let me be close friends with, even those out in the distance, even those that God's brought in my life that didn't necessarily jihaw. I didn't jihaw with them or they didn't jihaw with me. Yeah, Y'all don't have any like that, but occasionally a preacher will get one. I mean, it's not often, but occasionally will. You know right, Brother Bill? Did you know they did you good? Yeah, they, they really did. Boy, they helped you out. I can tell right now. Yeah. 
Hey, listen, friend. The people that God brings in your life, somebody says, you don't know what he did to me. You don't know what she did to me. You don't know how they treated me. I can tell you, if you took it right, it got you closer to God. It got you closer to God. Somebody said, but I wasn't converted. That's really what got you closer to God, if you're converted now. Used two years ago, and I never have, I hadn't done it in years and years, but there used to be a song that said, hard times have been good to me. I was thinking about how many people God brought into our lives and, and has touched our lives or influenced our lives. But you know something? My expectation is not from people. It's not from people. In fact, as good as, as good as it can be. And I have some tremendous, wonderful friends that would help me and do anything for me. But my expectation is not from people. I'll tell you something else. It's not from things. Some of y'all feel like if you can just get this thing or that thing or do this thing or the other thing, that ain't, that ain't going to satisfy your heart. That's not going to deliver you. That's not going to be a refuge for you. Oh no, things will never satisfy the spiritual need in your heart. And I'll tell you, go a step farther. Circumstances. You're leaning on the circumstances. You're thinking, boy, things get better and things are doing good. Did you know circumstances can flop right like that? They can change just like the weather. One day you can be sailing through in skies of blue. The next day you'll be dropped down in misery. Your health, you can't have an expectation in anything but the Lord. Thank God. The psalmist says, from whence cometh my help? My help cometh from the Lord. Hallelujah. I shall not be moved. Why? Because my soul's waiting upon God. Because my expectation is coming from God. And he said, then he said, I shall not be moved. And I'll, I'll just give you this little last thought. Because he only is my rock. Look what he said in verse number six. Verse number six says, says he only, not anywhere else, not anything else, not anybody else. He only is my rock. Steadfast, unmovable. He's my rock, my rock. I love the old song. We used to sing in the church quite a bit. The old song says, Oh, the Lord's our rock, in Him we stand. A shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever ill betides. A shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land. In a weary land, in a weary land. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land. A shelter in a time of storm. I'm saying to you this, friend. I'm saying to you that thank God he's our only rock. You remember in the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up in his temple. Isaiah had been pretty well in the temple and around the things of the Lord there in Jerusalem. And he was really in the, he was in the political realm. He, he was giving advice to the king. In fact, he was really leaning upon Uzziah. He was his, he was, he was a commandant to Uzziah. And then God, let Uzziah die. And in the year that God knocked the props out from underneath his prophet is when he saw the Lord. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Don't believe, you can believe it or not, but God knocked the props out from underneath you so that you can see the Lord. He is only, only him. He's our rock. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. You know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I'm not much for these little ditties, little songs, you know, that you have about six or seven words and you sing them 97 times. I'm just, I'm, that's not me. That's not, I, I just, 
you know, I, I, I don't know when to stop. If you ever get started, when do you stop? How do you stop them, you know? Well, yeah. But there was one old song that the saints used to sing. And it used to go like this. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree planted by the waters. I shall not be, you remember that old song, don't you? Glory, hallelujah, I shall not be moved. Anchored in Jehovah, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree planted by the waters, I shall not be moved. Oh, I'm telling you, David says, not in myself, but in thee, O Lord, I'm putting all my confidence, and I shall not be moved. Let me ask you, would you dare make a statement like that? Would you say, dare to say that in your Christian life, in your Christian effort, I shall not be moved? What about when the family wants to do this, that, and the other thing, and it directly conflicts with your interest in the Lord? What if the job demands you do something that's not right? conflicting with your interest with the Lord. What if you purchase that which is going to demand all your time conflicts with your following the Lord? I'm just simply saying this. David says, I will not be moved. Somebody somewhere needs to get some, I think I heard somebody say it this morning, some intestinal fortitude to say, I shall not be moved. Here's the way we're going to walk in it. We're going to stand for God. We'll be steadfast, unmovable in our service and our work for God. I shall not be moved. In about time, some of that kind of Christianity welled up inside of us. That's what breeds confidence in the living God. Thank you for spending the time with us at the Blue Ridge Baptist Church YouTube channel. And while you're here, please select from our playlist previous messages from both our pastor, Brother Ralph Coleman, and many other preachers and evangelists. So avail yourself of these ministers of the gospel and share with friends and family. And I know you will both find and be a blessing. And as always, from here at Blue Ridge Baptist Church, to God be the glory. Praise the Lord.